Well, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome everyone to episode three of celebrating Down to Earth Month and California's commitment to sustainability. I'm Amanda McCrossin. I am delighted to be back here with you, Aida. How are you? Great, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm excited because we're talking about some pretty cute critters, uh, yeah. which is like, you know, just always the best whenever we get to talk about animals. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, we've talked about why you should care about sustainability. We've talked about sustainability versus biodynamic and organic. Naturally, the next thing we would talk about is animals, obviously, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And honestly, the, the past two conversations, we actually haven't been able to not talk about animals because they do play such a critical role in the vineyard. But I love this topic of conversation. And it's one that I think is valid because we see animal, cute little animal IGs uh, pop up all the time. And people are like, yeah, they're really cute, but also they play a pretty big role in what we're doing here. So I'm excited to dive into what that is exactly. Uh, let's just do a quick little refresh recap of all things sustainability. Uh, you wanna kick it off with what is sustainability, why we're here? Yeah, of course. So as you all know, it's down to earth month, which here in California, we're celebrating 10 years of sustainable practices and sustainable actions within our greater wine industry. And I know you all basically could pass this quiz with flying colors, but just to reiterate, uh, the way that we've been introducing sustainability to you is to think about the three E's. So in it's ideally would achieve like check all three boxes of being environmentally friendly, being economically viable, and also being socially equitable. And so, as we've told you in the past, you know, sometimes you might think of one of those things, but all three of those things are what the wine industry as a whole is really achieving. And um, yeah, we're, you know, the wines we've been introducing you to are achieving all that through various means. And we have some interesting stories with today's wines to continue on that path. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, touching on what we talked about last week, which was organic yes. and biodynamic and that Venn diagram that the three of them together sort of build alongside sustainability. So not putting one against the other, not treating it in any sort of hierarchical fashion, but really just letting those three work together so that we can move towards sustainability uh, and a, a better future for all. So I'm really excited to dive into today and the wines that we've got, because I think there are three really standout representations of all the things that we've talked about thus far. So I think we should start, we'll go, we'll go white to red first. So we'll start yes. with Rudd Estate, which is something that's, you know, very close to me. Um, this is the Crossroads by Rudd. We'll be talking about Rudd Estate and Crossroads sort of interchangeably. Rudd Estate uh, is sort of the, the mothership of this winery. Crossroads is a, a second label of sorts. Um, but the reason it is so important to me is I, I worked for Press Restaurant for years as their sommelier and wine director. Uh, and it was owned and founded by Leslie Rudd, uh, who also owned Rudd Estate. And this place really just became really, really special to me because you know it was probably the winery that I went to the most. It was the one that I had the most connection with. Um, for a long time, there was a farm up on Mount Veter that uh, you know, is part of the estate, even though the, the winery itself is in Oakville in Napa Valley, uh, there was a farm that was supplying produce to press restaurant. And so all these things were very, very connected and uh, sustainable in that way as well. So we're talking about Red Estate today. And what I love about this place is they've always had, you know, this commitment to sustainability. They're also organic and biodynamic, and they've also got their own team to run everything. So they're literally like everything is a state from wine growing to wine making, everything is completely sustainable in every sense of the word. So um, I, I love that about them. We are specifically talking about the Sauvignon Blanc today, which is coming from their Mountain Theater estate. And uh, it's a gorgeous representation. The Crossroads was something that we got to pour by the glass, which is such a treat because the Red Sauvignon Blanc is just one of like the great Sauvignon Blancs of California, but definitely doesn't fit into that by the glass bracket. So they, they <laughs> created the Crossroads, which is a lot more accessible in price. Um, so we'll be we'll be talking about that a little bit more today. They also have like the cutest sheep on, on the property and um, all sorts of animals that we'll dive into for a, a myriad of reasons. But uh, one of my favorite IGs to look at because they always have like the cutest pictures. Um, so that is Crossroads by Red that we'll be talking about today. Ida, I know you and I both love Hanzel. Um, yes. That is a place that we've talked about before in past live streams, and I'm excited to talk about it again. So um, you want to paint the picture of Hanzel, and I'll, I'll grab the bottle. 
Yeah. So, I mean, the, the thing about Hansel is I was saying to Amanda earlier when we were talking about this subject matter that I had been living out, I'm native Californian, right? I had been living outside the state and then came back in the early 2000s. And what, one of the things that really struck me when I was going on wine, you know, winery visits and tours and tastings and what have you was seeing how integrated a lot of these properties were. And one that really struck me was Hansel. First of all, you're talking about, you're in the Mayakamas, which, you know, are just like absolutely gorgeous. Like we should all own, we're all gonna own property together there someday. <laughs> um, and this property goes back. I mean, it's one of the most historic properties within mm -hmm. California's wine country. And it has this perch, right, Amanda, where you almost feel like you're in like an eagle's nest or something, looking yeah. down over the Sonoma area. And I feel, for me, it just really coalesced as you walk around there. It, by the way, we always feel like you should be tasting and at booking appointments whenever you're traveling through California. All the wine wineries we're talking about, um, Hansel does need quite a bit of um, forethought because it's by appointment only. Um, but it's so worth it because you're up like perched in their farmhouse and you actually see all the animals they have on property, mm -hmm. all the different pieces that go beyond just grapes. We're not just talking about grapes being grown upon grapes upon grapes like other parts of the world. And that's something that's so unique to California is this embracement by embracement, sorry, this embracing by <laughs> by our by um by our winemakers and our wineries just of this idea that this shouldn't just be one grape growing and that's the only thing as far as the eye can see. And so Hansel I think really brought that to light for me as a wine enthusiast. Yeah, and by their own definition, they they say they're rooted in a. I'm going to read uh, rooted in a holistic yes. approach where the vineyard is one part of an interconnected farm ecosystem, uh, which really sums up what what it is they're doing. Because to your point, Ida, it's not just about the grapes; it is about a larger ecosystem, which is really it really speaks to all things sustainability. So they are practicing. Uh, biodynamics, they are practicing organics, but really for them, they want to make sure that, you know, this is something where every everyone is working together for the greater good to the point where it really is sort of, uh, you know, they're working towards like a closed loop ecosystem, wherein everything uh, that is made and consumed comes from that property. So anything I should also, I should also note that is, that has to be brought in, any material brought on property, again, I'm sorry, I'm reading, brought on property from yeah. outside sources are certified organic solely from manufacturing manufacturers with strong ethical social and environmental platforms I mean could you ask for like a better representation of every single thing that we're talking about today um, than something you know a, a winery that is that committed uh, to not only trying to do everything that they, they can on property but then also making sure that what they are bringing in also adheres to the organic nature and the sustainable nature so that everything is sort of working together so to your point and very his go ahead Oh, no. And I was just going to say, and, you know, this is one of these premier wines. One of the things I feel like we keep wanting to reiterate during this series is a lot of your favorite wines are already doing these practices, right? Over 80% yeah. of California wineries in California is of the wine industry is certified sustainable. And so you can like pleasantly, it's this like pleasant discovery, at least for me as a wine lover, where you're like, oh my God, this wine I like absolutely love drinking and is one of my absolute favorites is also doing good on yeah. all of these fronts. And so it's like all the more reason that I want to be supporting them in every way possible, right? It's it's like just yes. yay, all the boxes checked. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you hit on a great point because as you mentioned, Hansel was a favorite of mine. We used to you know, have old vintages of Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays, from, mostly Pinot Noirs, but, you know, old, like, 68 yeah. Hansel Pinot Noirs from yesteryear. Yeah. So I went into Hansel not knowing who they were and what they did. I went in as a fan of their wines and then yeah. came out an even bigger fan when I realized, you know, how committed they are. And and if you go there, and I really encourage that you do, I mean, you will see all the animals. You will see all the great things that they're doing. It's old school, but in, like, a great way. Uh, and you'll, yeah. I'm sure, fall in love with the wines the way that we have. Um and then last but not least, we're heading over to Lake County, which we actually haven't really spent a lot yeah, of time much in. Time there. Um, yeah. yeah, so we're going to be uh, in the in the Red Hills ADA, 
Uh, this is the Hawk and Horse. Um, I've got the Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, Aida, I think you've got the Cabernet Franc open. So I do. Get to yes. Explore a little bit of both today. Um, yeah. But I mean, with a name like Hawk and Horse, like I guess it's not really a surprise that they have animals on property. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I think you know what's what's really really cool about Hawk and Horse. Uh, this is actually uh, you know an old uh, abandoned horse breeding facility that was purchased in the eighties. And then uh, Mitch and Tracy Hawkins, they they came into the property in like the late 90s um, and brought their horses. They, you know, huge horse lovers, uh, but really wanted to have this sort of holistic, um, you know, this this ranch life. It's it's where they live. It's where they play. It's where they make their wine. It's their business. It's everything. So it stands to reason that this place would be a little bit more self-sustainable. So they are farming biodynamically. They are certified, Demeter certified biodynamic. Yep. Um, but then the, one of the other really cool things that they have are these Scottish Highland cattle on property. Um, and I guess that's probably a really good place to start is, uh, is these cattle because it, that's probably of the of the animals that we are going to be talking to, to talking about today oh gosh i wish we could talk to the animals um talking about today i think the cows are the ones that we don't see that often but they actually yeah. play a really really critical role and as we talked about biodynamics last week and how that plays into sustainability you know one of the things that is a part of biodynamics are these preparations so these compost and these sprays and so if you are you know practicing biodynamics you could actually purchase those things right like you could bring those things from off property onto property but the way that you would elevate that to make it more sustainable would be obviously to create those preparations on property. And so what you do, um, I guess the sustainable action here is going to be uh, having the cows on property to have the manure to bury in the in the cow horns um, and then create these sprays. So let's show some people some pictures because yes. I feel like because of all like the cattle, possibly the Scottish cattle, the Highlands are like the cutest of yes. all the cattle. Um, they really are. Yeah, I mean, you just also with like all the lore that goes along with the Scottish Highlands and history. I'm like, of course, this is the gorgeous cattle that comes from there. Like, why would we expect yes. anything less? But <laughs> yeah, you know, we were we were saying um, that the ultimate right with biodynamic. Uh, I mean, look at those. They're just the little. Yeah. I just want to be friends with them. Yeah, I mean, so cool. wine making has to be so much more enjoyable when that guy just comes along and is like, hey, what's happening? How's your day going? Right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. So these are the Scottish Highland cattle that you will find at Hawk and Horse in Lake County. And just to give a little proximity of where Lake County is, um, I should also I haven't had any of this wine yet. Um, Lake County is like north of Napa, but it's it's a huge AVA. Huge. Um, yeah. And it's interesting because Andy Bextoffer was just recently quoted in a video as saying, like, this is the place that he's most excited about, which is mm -hmm. huge for someone like Andy. And if you're unfamiliar with who he is, I mean, anytime you've had like a premier Napa Valley single vineyard designated wine, um, I'm sure you've come across like, you know, something, something, something. Beckstoffer Tokelon, Beckstoffer Missouri sure. Hopper, Beckstoffer Georgia III. So Andy Beckstoffer has been farming in the Napa Valley since the 60s. He is one of the, the most famous guys for bringing very famous vineyards to light. Uh, and that is a place that he's very excited about. So Lake County, very, very cool. Um, a big, big AVA, but these uh, these Scottish Highland cattle, you know, amazing for so many reasons. Like I said, uh, the cow dung compost. Yeah, we're going to talk, be talking about some manure today. It's okay. Don't get grossed out. Um, this is what they are adding to the soil in the early winter, uh, which is great because it's adding in nutrients in lieu of having to add in fertilizers. So you're you're it's it's there's so many pieces to this puzzle. Like I don't even think that we could begin to no. talk about, um, you know, all the great benefits of, of why you should have animals like this in the property, but, you know, specifically related to biodynamics, you know, we're talking about these preparations. So the cow dung compost, um, the horn dung for the roots. So, you know, you probably heard us talking about last week, you know, digging uh, in, in the, uh, in the winter, they're actually burying the, burying the horns that are stuffed with the cow manure. Um, again, sorry to be gross, but it's actually going in the ground. And what that, that is supposed to do is add more bacteria and life into the ground. So you're really just, you know, reinvigorating it with all the nutrients it's going to need. Um, and then the last thing is going to be the horn silica. So the yeah. you know, finely ground silica, which is a really, really interesting process. I've actually, I don't know if you've ever done a biogenomic prep spray. Um, it literally, like I, I think I mentioned it last week, it really is sort of like spraying water. It's completely unharmful. Yeah. Um, 
but it's one of the only sprays that you'll see going on a biodynamically farmed vineyard. And you literally just like, you kind of like spray it back and forth and like, you don't wear a mask or anything. It just like, it's just there. And it just, um, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be sprayed in the plant and then uh, it aids in photosynthesis. So it really helps to kind of like bring everything together. So like I said, by having these cows on property, it means that the compost can be, and the sprays can be made right here using the, the animals that they have um, without having to bring in anything extra. So there you go, yeah, there's our cow. And we, and we should say that when it comes to Demeter certification, like the absolute ultimate in being biodynamic is this concept of a closed loop. Um, and that's obviously not always the most realistic, but you're seeing properties like Hawk and Horse really bring that to fruition thanks to these cattle. So it's not, you know, like Amanda's saying, it's not just, oh, we get to do this and have the marketing speak around it. It really is allowing them, like Hansel, to have control over the quality of every step along the way yes. right yes. um so yes i mean is it is it very particular and possibly type a yes but does it create some of our favorite wines <laughs> yes it does it does it does so well, yes just, i, I have it speaks to the commitment of the wine right like it just i think whenever we think about wineries that are taking these added steps like obviously from a from a social and a and a, and a care perspective it obviously mm -hmm. once you know makes at least when i'm thinking about buying things it makes me more inclined to want to support businesses like this but also you know it stands to reason that a winery that is taking this many um this many steps to ensure these kinds of things like it's probably going to be pretty great wine right like you know yeah. all a state like they're doing all the right things like surely that has to translate on some level into the glass so while we can't always uh, attribute, you know, sustain, you know, is a sustainable wine necessarily a delicious wine? Well, who can really know for sure? We hope that it is, but you know, you have to think that if they're taking this much time and putting this much effort into it, that's that has to translate somehow in the glass. So yeah, I mean, as a complete plant lady who has almost thirty plants in her <laughs> house, who spends a good portion of my day talking to them, spraying them, making sure they're human and everything is good. Um, you know, you, I, I have to say, people come into my house and they say like, you have absolutely gorgeous plants. They're beautiful, what have you. And that translates, I mean, it's just another form of agriculture. It translates to wine too. And I think sometimes we're drinking wine, we're getting into the tasting. There's so much that happens with the bottle and the glass, especially once you bring food into the equation, that it's sometimes easy to forget um, this is still agriculture and you still need to have high quality standards in the wine growing in order to make everything work um, in the long term yeah. for the environment and also to your point really high quality wine um, and also you know taking care of your employees like we were talking about with Barra last mm -hmm. week right so yeah um, absolutely. okay so we have talked about cows i feel like yeah. there's a few that are kind of expected maybe mm -hmm. um so i would say the next one that like you kind of might expect is sheep yeah i feel like sheep might be one i think that... so i think sheep okay. are definitely ones um, so let's show you some cute little lamb pictures because they're very cute. Um, shout out to Ryan Anderson who took this gorgeous video or gorgeous photo of, of Red Estate. So this is that's beautiful. In, um, actually, is this Oakville? This actually could be Veter. I feel like it's looking at it. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just assumed it was Oakville because it's flat. Oh, no, but, it know. is. It's Oakville. It's Oakville. So this, this is obviously during mustard season. So this is a cover crop that is uh you'll see in in the springtime that kind of pops up and um these lambs you know even lambs and sheep um these are called baby baby doll sheep so they they actually are part of the red family so the what can happen a lot and i don't know if you know this Aida, you probably do but there's also like rental sheep in napa valley so people um people will actually i love rent that their sheep that's amazing season um so they live in they live in st Helena. i've seen them you know and they're very okay. very happy um very very well taken care of but uh yes the sheep are used in lieu of tractors mowers um basically to keep the cover crop down so you let the sheep out and they go and they do all of their their grazing and their eating uh and it you know cuts down we were talking about organics yesterday right or last yeah. week um mm -hmm. and some of the you know the things that we we want to see with organics obviously cover crops and you know yep. we are not seeing any sort of like synthetic uh, fertilizers but we're also considering carbon emissions right we're considering yeah. soil we're considering carbon emissions so you know how do we do all the organic things that we want to do but then also have considerations for the environment around us making sure that we're not um you know we're not ruining the topsoil by you know a tractor passing through 
all the time trying to keep these cover crops under control. Um, what do we do? Well, we, you know, we bring these sheep in um, and the sheep can go in and make graze and, uh, you know, their hooves are great to like give a little bit of aeration for the ground. Yeah, a little tilling, yeah. It. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, you know, what are they doing after they're eating all of these del delicious cover crops? Well, they're, they're helping fertilize. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's probably some things that are come out on the back end. So uh, for that reason, you will see sheep all over wine country at uh, red you will see them all the time because they're there in fact the day that i did the biodynamic preparations with um macy stuff who's the viticulturist there um here i'm going to close this out so the day that i was there um mama mama sheep um oh gosh what are their names they're super cute um i'll think of it later mama mama sheep gave birth to you to two babies that morning so we got to see these two like you know tiny tiny little baby lambs um, yeah and uh anyway so they're part of the family they're taken care of by the vineyard crew so they're they literally are part of the family they're like the sweetest things but um yeah i mean the sheep pictures are great obviously we love to see them but they also play a pretty vital role in ensuring um all things uh cover crop maintenance uh, nutrients in the soil um and obviously you know not having to use synthetic fertilizer just like you were talking about with the, with the cattle um yeah i also just like want to call out these last two wines that we've tasted yes so, yes um, please the this hawk and horse you know we, we moved into the sheep but i was like tasting i was like this is an incredible wine and i yeah. was introduced to i have a cab franc and you have the cab soft Mm -hmm. right? and it's okay. it's really really delicious i mean this is yeah. like this is a wine i was actually introduced to a couple of years ago i actually went up and met with tracy to talk mm -hmm. with her and she was actually the first one that was like i was like oh i was like you know what's the deal with all the animals and she was like well it's you know x y and z but the, i have to tell you the one takeaway that i got she said um she's like yeah there's scorpions up here she's like that's why we keep the chickens around and i was like what do you mean she's like the chickens you know kind of like ward off the scorpions on the property yeah and I had no idea. I was like, oh my gosh, that, you know, I, I would never have thought such a thing. You know, chickens don't seem that scary and a scorpion certainly does. But um, I thought that was super interesting. But this wine is just, it's gorgeous. Yeah. It's it's lifted, it's vibrant. It feels like it has energy. It feels like it has this like, just this freshness to it um, without it being you know overpowering. It's got, you know, dense, dense flavor, but it's not a dense wine by any means. You know, and I didn't realize because I'm mm. still very much learning all things wine right now in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize that Lake County had volcanic soil, which totally makes yes. sense. But you're really feeling the influence of it in this wine in particular. At least I feel like I am. And um, it, it makes so much sense. I mean, you're like, of yeah. course, like fault lines. Yes. But I don't know. I, I always feel for some reason like volcanoes are out in the water. Don't know where that misconception <laughs> comes on, but I'll have to look into that later. Um, yeah. But yeah, that whole area of Lake County has such rich soil. Um, and yes. particularly Hawk and Horse is on red volcanic soil. So it is really, you yeah. know, bringing a lot to the wine. Yeah, they're in the Red Hills AVA, which is known for this, like, and you can, I don't have pictures of it today, but you can pull up pictures of the volcanic soils, and it really is, like, red, red volcanic soil. Red, right? Yeah, um, super. And it's, it's right, super it's, rich. you know, it's crazy to look at, uh, but yeah, I think you're right, like, when it comes to how that's translating in the glass, I definitely think that there is a volcanic sort of mineral element, there just also seems yeah. to be just a hint of, like, um, yeah, something like a little zesty that I really love, that yep. I find with wines, especially from, like, uh, you know, like Etna Rosa's and like Etna Rosa's like, exactly. like, like, uh, Mount exactly. Etna area. Yeah. So if you really like that, if that's kind of your jam, it's not quite a spiciness or pepperiness, but there is something, right. um, you know, just a little like silty about it that I really love. Yeah. Uh, that is, that's this wine. Um, and Definitely. then this, this Mount Vitor is serving a Blanc is just like, I mean, you don't have to go far into the glass for it to jump no. out, but it's just no, like, no, 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 no. This, this has a nose. It's giving you like all sorts of freshness and um, it's like, hello, I'm here yeah. and I'm bringing it in the nose and I'm bringing yeah. it in the glass. And I, I, again, like, I, I know this is, you know, probably power persuasion and maybe a little confirmation yeah. bias, but these wines always seem like they have just so much life and so much energy and they they tell a story which is really really cool i love that they're telling a story of place um and again you know mount mount Vitor, just a gorgeous gorgeous place where they're getting this sauvignon blanc from but uh just a touch of semillon but a, a and i know wine. yeah and i know that we're not getting really into the actual tasting all that much today but one of the things yeah. that we think is really fun about these particular wines is that they're all kind of triangulating around mm -hmm. this area of Lake County, Sonoma, and Napa, but they're all kind of on different sides of the Mayacamas, um, you know, ridge, mountains, whatever you want to say, um, with 
uh, but Hawk and Horse is at a little bit of a higher elevation. So I think it's just, you know, if you want to nerd out a little bit, it's fun to sit there and try wines that are just from slightly west, slightly east, slightly higher, slightly lower. So it's um, that the each of the, the wineries bring that to the glass as well. Um, and one of the things that I think you know, is really special about this area is just that first and foremost, before anybody planted a vine in this general part of the state, there was always agriculture. And so you really have this, like, I think kind of historic mentality, especially on these wineries that we're talking about today, that, okay, there's more going on here than just the wine. And so not only are they having these animals on property, because that makes sense. Like my mother grew up on a farm, of course, there were all the animals we're talking about today were always hanging out where she grew up. But also you have different things growing um, not just the cover crops, but, you know, just some kind of diversity. So it's not like a monoculture basically happening in exactly. at these properties. And that is um, such but, a big pillar of sustainability too, you know, a balanced ecosystem, making sure that, you know, everything is, there's not one thing that's dominating the other. Yeah. And so we've talked a little bit about the chickens. I do have to say growing up um, a horseback rider, you always love chickens because horses hate scorpions and chickens do help with them. I can attest to that. But the other ones that I feel like, I mean, just are total work, work horses, even though they're animals. Um, the other animals I think just do a ton of work in, for us in the, in the wineries are hawks and barn owls in particular. Yes. Um, yeah. And, you know, Amanda can attest like, I, how is it like you see one red tail hawk an hour when you live in the Napa Sonoma area? I feel like they're just like yeah. as many red tail yeah. hawks as humans up there. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. I just, I just pulled up the picture of the chicken, which I'm sure everyone's seen so before, cute. but these, ch these chickens are, you know, they're great for so many different things. Um, you know, especially with sustainability because they, they can like, you know, roam around the vineyards kind of freely and take care of all the critters, but, um, and all the insects, but yes, to your point, barn owls, which is, I'm, I'm going to pull up, um, right now. Um, so and while you do that, I just wanted to say guys. like one of the things, one of the things I never really thought about because I didn't grow up on a, on a farm. Um, I remember I was doing a farm visit for, you know, just a, uh, oh, a beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. Uh -huh. um, one of the things that I think it, it took me a minute to coalesce for me was that all these animals can actually be like they are at Hansa, like they are at Hawk and Horse. A lot of them can be coexisting because they are serving such different purposes. Like the sheep and the cattle are never gonna get as deep down and like burrow into the soil the way a chicken is going to. Yes. Or they're not gonna chase off rodents the way that our friends, the barn owls do. Yeah, so the, these are barn owls. Um, and this is actually a, a, a photo from the Press Democrat. Um, but the barn owls are really interesting because they, you know, they control the rodent population in a very big way. So, mm -hmm. you know, while cover crop is great, and we obviously want that to maintain the health of the soil, what it also can invite is a lot of things like gophers and voles, which are really, really detrimental to the vines. Yeah. Um, in fact, like they can work their way all the way through, gophers can work their way all the way through um, the base of a young vine uh, in a single feeding season, which is wild. Yeah. Like, that's, you know, that's a lot of stuff I believe to work it. through. Um, voles, you know, same thing, like they can work through fully mature vines. So these are things that, you know, while we we want the, we want nature to take its course, of, of course, um, we also need to sort of control that in a way. And so I think what a lot of winemakers and, and viticulturists are doing are looking at, you know, how can we introduce some natural predators to ensure that, you know, we're not losing the fruit that we've worked so hard for. So one yeah. of the ways that they're doing that are introducing things like red tail hawks and and barn owls. And so um, what they're doing is creating natural habitats for these for these animals. And so with the for the barns, uh, for the owls, you know, even though an owl normally nests uh, in the cavities of trees and like caves uh, and rocks. Uh, what what happened is because some of those owls really lost their habitat um, due to, you know, some, you know, this is yeah, development, ago, yeah. but development. Um, they, they sort of reacquainted themselves uh, and, and migrated to other places like in the inside of barns. And so that's why they get the name barn owls, but they're great because they actually will consume uh, about a thousand rodents in a single 
season. Um, so this is like a little family of barn owls that were introduced. So basically what the wineries are doing is just, you know, giving these guys a home, giving them a place to like, you know, feel like they're welcome and they're part of part of the community. Um, they they actually do need a bit of maintenance. So their, you know, their habitats do have to be cleaned because they're not particularly cleanly animals. But if you keep it clean and you keep it, uh, he, um, uh, what is the word? Uh, habitable? habitable? I don't know why I can't put Habitable? That. Habitable, thank you. Um, <laughs> then they will continue to live and, and support the ecosystem around it. So just, you know, one of those things that you don't necessarily think of, obviously, you know, we don't see owls all that often because they are nocturnal, um, but these gorgeous barn owls are just so, so cool. One of the other yeah, things and that it, I think is, go ahead. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, I was just no, gonna I, say that, you know, we talked a lot about wildlife habitat and how important that is. And the examples that we were giving in the past episodes are about wildlife corridors being open for migration, right? But to Amanda's point, there are also these kind of win-win scenarios where a relatively endangered species can also be beneficial to the winery. And so they're given back some form of, you know, um, agency and, and existence in these areas um, by also helping the wineries out. So, you know, again, going back to that idea of, things being economically viable and also environmentally friendly in order to be sustainable, this is a perfect example of that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I, yeah, I'm sure you've run into a, a winery dog or two here and there. And, you know, some winery dogs are really just great for grabbing the cheese off your plate and making yep. sure that like, you know, you're not in taking too many calories, which we always appreciate. Um, but there are some like really I won't say more beneficial. We won't, we won't give them, uh, we won't hierarchy them, but um, there are some other dogs called the sniffer dogs. These are golden retrievers that I'll share uh, that you will find at places like Honig, which we had talked about in our very first episode. Uh, and I think we may have showed this picture, but this, these are the sniffer dogs. So these are golden retrievers that have been trained um, to do things like early detection of uh uh, what is it? Uh, vine mealy bugs. Vine mealy so bugs. Mealy, yeah. Yeah. So they're really, really hard to detect. Um, they're like, you know, you can't see them with a naked eye. Um, so what they've done is they, they've trained these dogs to detect the female pheromone of the vine mealy bugs, uh, which is huge because it means that the early detection means that they're not going to have to, um, you know, spray more vines that they would have to. Um, it also means that they won't have to replant things. I mean, there a whole host of things as to why this yeah. is important, but, um, you know, a very cute little pup that is doing a very, very big job. So yeah. well done to the sniffer dogs. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, we can't, you know, one of the other things that we talked about a lot uh, that first week is that part of sustainability um, is bringing in the good insects and animals in order to keep out the bad insects and animals. Yes. And I mean, you're going to think of all kinds of insects, but we would be remiss if we didn't mention bees. Um, yes. And as Amanda and I were saying earlier, you know, I, I think people assume they're helping with the actual um, grape and like vine pollination, and that's ap actually not hap the truth. The um, you know the flowers can actually self pollinate, so um, it really comes down to a cover crop issue. Where keeping these cover crops, you know, if I always think of um, classically, you might see like roses at the end of some of these his very historic vineyards, right? And those roses mm -hmm. are to attract bees. Ultimately to then pollinate whatever cover crop is there in order to, you know, help the health of the soil. So, you know, bees might not be helping directly, but they're helping indirectly in a very, very important way. Um, and I don't know if this is the case in Napa, but throughout California, you know, we do have, well, actually I know it's the case in, what is it, Bo Bothell State Park, right? Is that what it's called? Am I just making oh. up? No. That's that's in Washington. What, um, what is the name of this? What is the park near Charles Schultz? It's close. It's close to that. And I'm anyway, there's the a name. park yes. I'm forgetting the name of that Amanda knows what I'm talking about. Anybody else in the Sonoma area knows what I'm talking about. And um, I he's no longer there, but there used to be a Frenchman who maintained like some of the most active apiaries in wine country, and he would actually bring in his, um, you know, all, all of the different bees to the wineries as needed. And I, he's, I, I can't believe, I can't think of his name or the name of this, <laughs> of this park, but I can assure you that they're, um, you know, that it was a very important job and continues to be. 
yeah, bees are bees are as we talk about ecosystems and sustainability, which you know sort of go hand in hand. Bees play a huge role in just balance and ensuring that like you know things are being um, pollinated. Um, you know, bees in a in a any sort of agricultural landscape are generally a sign of health. So we want bees yeah. to be there, even though they may not be directly correlated to you know the the actual health of the vine. They are you know tangentially related and a very very big yeah. part of the health of the ecosystem. I will also mention that there's several wineries that have uh, beehives on their property yeah. for that very reason and also make their own honey. So that yes. is like one of the great secrets of wineries. Um, and in fact, I think there's like a few that have just started releasing their honeys from um, 2021. The honey from a vineyard, and I, I'm sure you've had your fair share. I've got a, a jar of the Frog's Leap honey upstairs. Oh, yes. Uh, unfor unfor you'll laugh because unfortunately this is for my sister and my dad didn't know it. And he used the honey for his toast and my sister is celiac. So now she unfortunately can't use the honey any longer because <laughs> it wasn't gluten free. Um, but it is like some of the most delicious honey. It's like caramel um there yeah. was really nothing like like vineyard honey so an added bonus uh that except maybe, maybe vineyard is... olive oil i'm just gonna throw that out there there's a lot of good olive oil being made by a there lot of vineyards a lot in california of, but more, so i'm just gonna throw that out there <laughs> <laughs> no for sure olive oil i'll grab your olive oil grab your honey um also frog's leap makes a delicious uh set of like preserves and jams that are delicious on cheese and since we're talking about cheese and the fifth week like I don't know, maybe you can all leave it in. I think that's like some, I mean, some version I know, of sustainable, right? Yes. Amanda knows that I teach week, weekly cooking classes and my co-teacher uh, used to be like one of the head culinary over at Frog's Leap back, back, back in the day. So yeah. we always have like, we bonded over a mutual love of Frog's Leap when we first became oh. friends. Um, okay. But they do a great job. We're not including frogs them in any and ways, but. bees. The only little family of critters we haven't talked about so far are basically just all the other insects like yeah. spiders and ladybugs. 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 I mean, Hello, doing ladybug. their part. Yes, <laughs> look at these. Look at these pretty little ladybugs. I am completely blanking on who it was that told me this story, but uh, a vintner bought, so you can you know buy ladybugs. Um, and a vintner bought some ladybugs and introduced them to, I don't know if it was a male or female, but introduced them to his or her vineyard and uh, didn't know that ladybugs have to be released in the nighttime, not in the daytime, and all the ladybugs flew away. Um, but ladybugs are great because they are very selective predator bugs that will, uh, they're really, really helpful with um, with leaf hoppers. So if you've got a leaf hop, leaf hopper, say that 10 times fast, leaf hopper issue in your vineyard and quite a few do in Napa Valley um they're wonderful for just sort of like eradicating them so um you know a lot of vineyards will introduce you know certain ladybugs and mites and different bugs in lieu of pesticides so it was as we think about sustainability this is one of those things where not only can we keep a healthy balanced ecosystem um, but we're also eliminating the use of harmful things in our vineyard um, which is great so ladybugs yeah. uh you know whenever you see those those pretty little ladybugs don't you know don't like blow them away like they're supposed to be there yeah so we've <laughs> talked about cows sheep chickens yes. owls red tail hawks bees ladybugs and other beneficial insects um, if there's any important animal insect family that we forgot today let us know in our comments but um i know that we actually covered pretty much all the animals aside from maybe like a barn cat that live on, yes. the, on these <laughs> on these wineries that we're talking about today um and yeah i mean i just think that you know amanda for me it it comes back to this idea of being, um, I'm, I'm just gonna throw it out there, but you know, coming from my heritage of being Italian American, um, my grandfather did always grow grapes. And you know, sometimes your grandparents just know best and he would always just be like, of course I need to have all these things and there has to be all this. And like, so basically my no no was like sustainable before we had the word for that. And as so much of that generation was. Um, and I think it's just, so nice to see us coming full circle, especially in the wine world where, um, you know, sometimes when you're tasting, it's just all about the glamour of being with your friends and tasting the wine. Um, and then you realize that there's these steps being made that are making the environment better and are making the wine arguably better in the glass as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm all about it. And anytime I can hang with all the animals while enjoying wine, I think my life's complete.
I agree. It's a good thing. And, um, you know, one of the things that I, one of the questions that I'm often asking, and it was probably one of, like I said, the, one of the most revelatory conversations that I had was at Hansel with, with the winemaker there. And um, one of the big questions that I'm always asking is, are you concerned about monoculture and how that will have an impact on um, on this region? And I ask it, you know, everywhere that I go, because I, you know, I see that being um, something that could be an issue, but something that we're also fighting against. And the answer is, is, almost always yes. And we're always working towards finding ways to introduce other things besides just the vines so that we can keep a healthy, balanced uh, ecosystem, which, you know, often in, in turn makes for greater, greater wines, a greater environment for our people, um, which is all related to sustainability. But I just, I love that this is not only a conversation, I love that this is something that, that people are working towards, that it is sort of becoming second nature and that we're seeing it with a lot more regularity to your point, over 80% of the of the wines in California are, are sustainable. So are being made in a sustainable fashion. So um, huge improvements, love seeing, the, love seeing the animals, love that they're playing a huge role. Um, it makes for life in California that much better and more fun and cute and wonderful. And uh, if there's anything better than drinking a glass of wine. It's definitely seeing like a sheep just kind of right, right next to you, so. I think so. So <laughs> we've told you this before, but just a reminder um, that there are all sorts of virtual tastings. And if you're based in California, actual, a few real live events, including like fun hikes and things happening all throughout the state over the course of April. And since we're halfway through, um, you still have plenty of time to join in those. So you can go to discovercaliforniawines.com to, learn all about that and make sure you can dive deeper even beyond this series. But um, Amanda, we do have two more left. Do you wanna give a little preview of what else we'll be talking about? Sure, yeah. So next week we are back here, same time, same place, but we are talking, we've talked about what all this is, but now we're gonna be talking about how to find it, how to spot these yeah. things in the wild. So everything from you know, logos, to certifications, websites, things like that, and, and what to ask, you know, what questions should you be asking? So we'll cover that in week four. And then week five, I sort of gave us a little hint earlier when we talked about Frog Leap, but we are uh, talking about California as a sustainable region in general and weaving in yeah. dairy. So, um, yeah. you know, I'm always down for like a little cheese and wine. I know you are too. So I think it's a good yeah. way to wrap this all up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, any of you who joined us for what grows together, goes together back in the fall, you saw us do a more fall oriented cheese plate. And this time we're going to be talking about a little bit more like spring. If we, you know, just kind of like heading toward these, these, um, this time we're in, maybe there's some rosé, maybe there's some bubbles, maybe there's some beautiful brie. I don't know, but you're going to have to join in order to check it out. Um, and yeah, if you, uh, have any other wines that you love and are trying to discover if they are sustainable, you can ask either of us on Instagram, you can go to California wines on Instagram or here on Facebook, or you can um, also go to, uh, that just launched dun, 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 very exciting, um, California sustainable wines.com. And that, I mean, Amanda and I, when it launched, we were both like, oh my God, this is like everything we need to know about sustainable wine in Finally. California, all in one place. <laughs> and I can look up the wine I have and everything. So that's a preview for next week. We'll be talking about it more then. But um, just if you want to get a head start and figure out which of your favorite wines are sustainable, you can head there. Hint, most of them are. Most of them are. Over 80%. <laughs> yes. I love that. I think that's well, it, right, Amanda? Do we have anything else? I think we covered it. Now we've got three wines that we are going to need to grab some cheese for and um, probably have like a little party. So let's hop to it right let's go look at some like okay. cute animal pictures on instagram and drink some wine i like it okay well right. cheers to that cheers Good to be with you again. Always, always a pleasure and i'll see you next week okay see you next week all right bye